Voland the Smith. Long, long ago, when the dark Nithud was a king in Sweden, in the land of the midnight sun, the Laps had a king of their own. This king had three sons, Slagfid the Iron Beater, Egil the Archer, and Voland the Wondrous Smith. One day they took their snowshoes and travelled south, hunting wild beasts and living off the bushes, till they reached the deep valley of Wolfdale, and on the shore of Wolf Water built themselves a house of firs and timber. Soon the snow melted and the ice loosed, duck and grebe covered the surface of the lake, and the squirrels threw last year's nutshells like hail on the rafters. Birdsong filled the forest, there were eggs in every nest. For all things finned, furred and feathered, this was the happy time, and none would have been happier than the brave young brothers in Wolfdale, had they but one thing. Watching the birds that flirted above them, and the furry nibblers that ran gambling in twos, hearing the brays and bellows in the mountains, and the crash of antlers in the glades, they longed for wives to share with them the springtime of their days. This too was granted them. One morning, at the lakeside, they found three white maidens weaving linen for raiment. Beside them on the shore lay their feather coats, for they were swan maidens from the south, who followed the wars and chose the slain and carried them to feasting and fame in the afterworld. But now they were weary and would rest in the sun, and for a season be women as mortal women are. Love filled the hearts of them all, and Slagfid took Swanwhite for his wife, and Egil married Olrun, and Voland wedded the maiden Hervor, the All-Wise. Seven years they lived in the house by Wolf Water, seven gold summers, seven white winters, till the Swan Maidens grew tired of their peaceful life, and longed once more to fly over the battlefield, and choose the heroes who must die and carry them on their wide white wings to the revelry in Valhalla. One day, when the brothers were deep in the forest hunting, they opened the chest where their feather coats had remained all this time hidden. They took them out and thought to try them on. Then a mad longing filled their blood. They cast off their linen garments, and quickly they rose into the air with a loud beating of wings and disappeared into the southern sky nor did they cast one glance behind them. The brothers returned to find their house empty. They will return soon, they told each other. Then, they will return before dark, brothers. But as evening fell, so fell doubt over their hearts, and the night was less dark than their foreboding. Then Voland took a pine resin torch and opened the chest, and they saw that it contained not feather coats now, but garments of linen. It is said that the brothers neither spoke nor cried aloud at that discovery, but that Slagfid and Egil ran headlong into the forest, bruising themselves against the trees, while Voland sat silent at the house door. A month later, when the land lay death-cold under snow, Egil and Slagfid took the skis of birch and strapped them on their feet. We cannot rest, they said. This house is hateful to us now. And Egil set off east to seek Olrun, and Slagfid south for Swanwhite, though it is quickest to say that they never set eyes on their wives again. But Volun stayed on in the Wolfdale, hoping by some chance his wife might yet return. Behind the house stood a smithy, for Voland was the best worker in metals the world had yet seen. To beguile the time, and in hope of his wife's return, he set himself to forging rings of the purest gold, many of them set with gems beyond price. Soon he had seven hundred of these rings, threaded on cords of bast, and hanging like small moons and suns from the rafters of the house. If his head or hand struck against the cords, they would spill runnels of melody, or chime and churm like tiny bells, so that the air grew harmonious with light and sound, and the owls stared in through the windows, yellow-eyed with surprise. 
but hardly had he completed his seven hundredth ring when news of his sojourn in Wolfdale reached the ears of King Nithud, who thought what a fine and easy thing it would be to win some of that treasure. Biding his time till he knew that Voland had left home, he came one night to Wolfdale in the waning of the moon, and while his men kept watch outside, entered the house and slid the last made ring gently from its cord. Greed grew in his breast as he smoothed the shining metal and saw its jewel sparkling by torchlight, and he ordered his men to take cover near the house and await their owner's return. Towards dawn, Voland came back from clearing his nets and night lines. He cut thin strips of bear meat from the hook and sat down by the fire to broil them. It seemed to him that there was some difference in the way the rings were now hanging, and when he counted them he found one missing. Perhaps, he thought, Hervor has come back to me. Perhaps she has chosen this way to let me know of her return. But there was no feather coat laid in the chest, only the garments of linen that they had left behind them. No, he whispered, this is no lucky day for me. Tiredness and misery overwhelmed him, and when he had tried to eat he threw himself down on a bed of furs and was glad to fall asleep. He woke in horror. Surely the nightmare was riding him down, her hard hooves pashing his chest and stamping his limbs to the ground. He tried to raise his hands to beat her off, but could not. He wished to rise and run from her, but he was helpless. It was then that he saw the heavy chains about his wrists and the strong fetters on his feet. It was then that he heard Nithud's laughter. The smith, laughed Nithud, is caught in his own chains. Then he changed to a sly sternness. Do you not know that I am lord over Wolfdale? Elf man though you are, how dare you withhold from me the treasures I see in your home? He called his men into the forest house, and his snake-eyed queen came with them. Not kind looks the hunter, she jeered. It would be well to work him a mischief. Let us cut the sinews of his knees so that he may never walk again, upright or far, and then do what we will with him and his treasure. We need not fear his vengeance. They did so, and the once proud Voland became a maimed and hobbling thing, as close to the ground as a beggar. King Nithud seized all his treasures for himself, even Voland's sword he took, and set in his own belt, and the first stolen ring he gave in triumph to his daughter Bothfield. Voland was set on an island in the sea, along with his tools and a smithy, and there in Seersvarstad he smithied for the king all kinds of precious things. One thing alone kept him alive, his desire for revenge on Nithud and all his kin. For that he masked the hatred in his eyes, for that he pretended to be still more crippled than he was, so that the day came when in contempt, not pity, they gave him such freedom on the island as a hurt dog has, or a three-legged wolf. All this while the king permitted none save himself to set foot on Seervarstad, for he wished neither to share his treasure nor let too many study his misdeeds. But no one is stronger than fate. Kings too must bow before it, and the day came when Nithud's young sons crossed to the island and visited the smith of whom they had heard so much. Voland, who had learned so many grim lessons, received them with smiles and kindness. You are welcome, king's sons, he told them. All in my smithy is yours. He showed them weapons and rings and filigrees, his tapping hammers and bellows of hide. Never, he saw, were sons more like to their father than these. Young as they were, their eyes gleamed with greed, their fingers were tricky as the limed twigs of the fowler. I would give you these things gladly, he said, plunging his arms up to the elbows in gold cups and brooches. But perhaps your visit is known and they would only be taken from you. He watched their faces fall. But if you return tomorrow, making sure that no one knows, then you may take these lovely things and hide them where you will. Licking their thin lips, they promised to do so, 
and with many a covetous backward glance took their boat and rowed homewards. Next day they returned. Quick, quick, they cried, show us the treasures which we are to carry off and hide. So be it, he promised, my brave jackdaws, and led them to a great coffer in the smithy. Lifting the lid, he gestured to them to look inside and choose at their pleasure. Now the coffer stood so tall and wide that they had to stand on tiptoe and crane with their necks over the edge. What they did not know was that the smith had sharpened the downward edge of the lid till it was keen as the executioner's axe. Look, my chattering starlings, he urged them. Look, my fine wolf cubs. And as they stood there, snarling and wrangling as to what should be theirs, their throats across the coffer's edge and their napes gleaming upwards, he slammed down the lid with such force that their heads leapt mouth foremost into the gold and their trunks slid lifeless to the ground. Straight away a tall pillar of smoke rose from the smithy roof, thrust through the trees and was joined to the clouds in heaven, and by the time that pillar crumbled and fell, all that was mortal of Nithud's sons, their flesh and bone and hair and garments too, was ash under the fire, all except their skulls, which Volan took and silvered over and fashioned into drinking cups for King Nithud, and their eyeballs, which he set as jewels in a broad gold talk, for the queen's throat, and their teeth, from which he fashioned brooches for the white breast of Bothfield, their sister. Such fine workmanship had never been seen in Sweden before. The cups never left the king's table, the talk never left the queen's throat, and for her two gold and ivory brooches Bothfield discarded all adornment, save for the gold ring which was also Volans. One day the princess Bothfield broke her golden ring. She was a gentle princess and given to fear and stood in such awe of her father that she dared not tell him of her mishap. Instead she took a boat and rowed to Sevarstad and asked Volan to weld the ring again so that none might know it had ever been damaged. So be it, he promised, and led her to his smithy. None knows that I am here, she pleaded. You will not tell my father? I will not tell, said Voland. He saw the brooches on her breast. You are pleased to wear them, princess? And well you may be. I have made only two other things as fine, your father's cups and your mother's talk, and only one thing finer. What is that? she asked. From the coffer which had slain her brothers, he brought forth a thin mesh coat of silver. It was so fine and delicate that it might be crumpled in one hand, so light that if it were thrown into the air it would be borne aloft like a shining cloud, and so strong that the sword's edge would shudder and grow dull upon it. What is it? she asked him. I would give everything I have for a thing so beautiful. He set food and drink before her as he answered, and she remembered that he had been a prince more handsome than the dawn, and a hunter swifter than the deer before her father made him captive, and her mother a cripple. Pity filled her breast and tears her eyes. But you have your secret, princess, he said coldly. I pray you leave me mine. More he would not say. He turned his back upon her, lest he pity her too, and his purpose grow blunted. The drink he had given her was strongly blended. She felt her eyelids heavy as sea sand, and all too quickly she had fallen asleep. Dreams bemired her, horrid and cruel as truth. She woke to fear and shame that she should be here alone with her father's smith, and without asking for her ring fled, dazed and dismayed, from the island. Then Volan spread his mesh coat of silver, and through every mesh he wove a wild swan's feather. Poets in the Southland say that it was Egil the archer, his brother, who shot those swans with his unfailing shafts, and brought the feathers to Sevarstad. When the coat was ready, he drew it about him, and with a soft swish of wings, rose into the air. Higher and higher he soared, till far below him he saw the small black roofs of his house and smithy, with their wisp of charcoal smoke, the soft sea of pines and firs, and the waters of the strait as hard and shining as though he had fashioned them of metal. 
and there opposite he saw the gabled hall of Nithud's palace, with its dark stockade, and as he plained and swooped in exultation, he saw his enemy the queen staring upwards from the palace yard. Nithud he did not see, for the king sat over his silver drinking cups and wept for his lost sons. Sometimes he would so rave and threaten that his men had grown afraid to speak to him. It was Voland, he shouted, as his queen entered the hall. It was he that killed my sons. Summon my men, bring me my boats and horses. I must go and question him. Doubt and fear are driving me mad. No need for boats and horses, said the snake-eyed queen. Voland is here and would speak with you. The king stood in the palace yard and Voland sank closer. Tell me, Voland, elf man, prince, what happened to my sons? First, called Voland, swear an oath never to hurt your daughter Bothfield. Though I make her my wife and she bear me a son, swear you will not hurt her. We swear, cried Nithard and his queen. We have learned her fate, her shame we can bear. But where, where, where are our sons? Their skulls are on your table, their eyes are about your throat, their teeth deck the breast of Bothfield, the rest is ashes and air. A curse on your greed, cried the queen to her husband. A curse on your cruelty, cried the king to his wife. A curse on us both and on all our line now and forever. From above, Voland looked down on the wolf eyes of the king and the snake eyes of the queen, and in a palace window he saw the sad dove eyes of Bothfield the White. Swiftly he drove upwards on his wild swan wings, leaving hatred and sorrow behind him. He saw the white shafts of the arches drift upwards like hailstones in an upside-down world, then falter, tremble and glide softly away. Higher still he rose, and as the seas and forests opened greener and bluer before him, his foes grew tiny and toy-like and black. Soon he could not tell one from another. His rage and bitterness left him, for vengeance was over and a new life calling. Somewhere he would find his brothers, Slagfid and Egil, or somewhere his wife, Hervor, the Allwise, and always there would be courts and kings to welcome the jewel smith. Laughing, laughing and laughing, and the black days lost in air, he let the wind take him and flew to the south and the future.